Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Brendan, thank you so much indeed, and thank you to you for inviting me. Thank you to Burnett. Thank you to friends and colleagues today who spent time with me. Let's dispose of this first of all. Who really cares about rugby? <laughs> <laughs> not me, not me. It's a, niche, it's a niche sport. Cricket, that's the important one. Um, yeah, you see, I had to win your audience straight away. Um, I want to um, invite you to, into my front room. If you came to London and uh, you came to my front room, and if you are passing through, just get in touch. You'll be welcome to uh, visit. Uh, above the fireplace, you would see this picture. Uh, what is it? It's a picture uh, that uh, digitally stitched together three photographs that my father took at the end of 1945 of Hiroshima. And as you can see, uh, Hiroshima sits uh, in something of a bowl, uh, surrounded by mountains. And there is just a desolate landscape, flat, hollow, um, pretty much peopleless at that time. And he was there as part of the Royal Electrical and Mechanical Engineers from the United Kingdom to help reconstruct bridges and put together some basic infrastructure. Uh, I've lived with that picture um, all of my life, and now I inflict it on my family uh, and anybody who comes to visit us. And it's there partly as a reminder uh, to me uh, of what human beings can do one to another. And that legacy uh, informs a substantial amount of what I'm going to speak about in the next 40 minutes. Because an authority of the eminence of Martin Rees, uh, a man who not only is he still astronomer royal, but he was president of the Royal Society, wrote in 2003 and continues to proselytize this message that the odds are no better than 50-50 that our present civilization will survive till the end of the present century. So we could toss a coin and uh, decide now just what the chance is that our civilization could last to the end of the century. And that's what Martin Rees, not a maverick scientist, uh, but somebody very much in the mainstream of science, is predicting for our future. It seems a very extreme view to take. But look at Syria. Now well into the fifth year of that conflict, with several millions of people displaced from that country, and as we've seen with the latest bombing by Russia, a conflict that seems to be pressing potentially a proxy war between Russia and the United States. We thought we were well prepared for emerging infectious diseases. We've been talking about preparations since the advent of SARS in 2003, but we were caught unawares by Ebola at the end of 2013 with the result that well over 10,000 people have died. Three countries have lost at least 20 to 30 years in terms of their development and the world is in an extraordinarily bad place in terms of its core public health capacities to be prepared for future pandemics. And then we look at the work of somebody like Johan Rockström from the Stockholm Resilience Center. The notion that we as a species live in a safe operating space, that's the area designated in the center of this circle, surrounded by a series of boundaries, particular threats, that if we damage our environment to a significant degree and cross a particular boundary, that is an irreversible position that we place our species in an acute danger. And if we step outside of that safe operating space, that will be a species eliminating event. And as you can see from the red areas in certain spheres, for example, loss of biosphere, changes in phosphorus and nitrogen cycles. We are already in danger in several of those. And look at some of the others, climate change, ozone depletion, aerosol loading of the atmosphere, acidif acidification of our oceans, fresh water use, changes in land use. All of these are the warning signals that tell us that we're overstepping our mark as a species on our planet. And then, when we think about that threat, the threat of environmental degradation, 
and place that in models of the future, we should be deeply concerned about where our species is going. The way we think, of course, and we have several colleagues from politics with us, is very much in terms of short-term political cycles. Thinking ahead as long as five years is pretty tough in the political cultures that we live in in our modern democracies today. But if you go to any museum in this city or any city in the world, you will see that museum full of art artifacts from other civilizations. And the fact is, civilizations are born, they typically thrive, and then they die. Why should our civilization be any different? And in this modeling by a NASA scientist and his team, Safa Motosharii, he looks on a 500-year time interval and looks at, you see the green line of the degradation of natural capacity, the environment which sustains us. And at the same time as our natural environment declines, we become much wealthier. And we're seeing that today. That is the story of very much of climate change over the next 50 or 60 years. And for those who live in poor environments, called here commoners, they are going to suffer more than the elites, the deleterious effects of the destruction of the environment. And what he is suggesting here is that we as elites will not notice until it is far too late that the destruction of our environment is linked to the potential for a species ending moment in this planet's history. In other words, inequality between the rich and the poor, what divides us in terms of our wealth, added to the planetary boundaries examined by Johann, Johann Rockström and his colleagues, create a set of conditions over a three or four or 500 year time period that are deeply troubling for our species. Now that's all very depressing, isn't it? A rather pessimistic start. So let me, let me tell a different story for a moment. Because we can convince ourselves, and often people do convince ourselves, oh please, do come back, <laughs> it's not such a terrible story. <laughs> This is what happens, you see. It is a very, very pessimistic story. But I want to tell an optimistic tale this evening. And the optimistic tale was well expressed by Antonio Gramsci. A pessimist because of intelligence, and that is indeed where the data tells us the trajectory of our species is heading. But we have the power, through our will, to tell a very different story. And that story is one that should inspire us. A book that I would encourage you all to read is Angus Deaton's book, which talks about the great escape. What was that great escape? It was the fact that in human history, it's only been in the last 250 years that humanity has escaped from what has been millennia of death and deprivation. Something very remarkable took place over the last 250 years. And we should think carefully about what was so remarkable. Because in a very short space of time, our species has achieved something quite remarkable. And today is a landmark day. And I'll explain why. Go back to 1990, and over 3 billion people were living in low-income countries. By 2011, just 20 years or so later, that figure for low-income uh, populations had fallen below 1 billion. And today, the World Bank announced, Jim Kim announced at the bank, that fewer than 10% of the world's population now lives in extreme poverty. Within a single generation, we have lifted billions of people out of extreme poverty. Not only have we done that, but that's been linked to a remarkable success in terms of delivering health. Let's look here from 1990 to 2013, and this is years of life lost. And you don't need to look, know what all the different colors are. They represent different diseases. But the importance is the trend, and the trend is that years of life lost 
have been, has been gradually declining over time. In other words, something positive has been taking place in terms of human health, in terms of life expectancy, over that period of pulling people out of extreme poverty. So here's a paradox. Our species has achieved something unprecedented during the past 250 years, and particularly within the past generation. And yet, that power that we've had to deliver such benefit is overlaid on a trajectory that is, yes, deeply pessimistic. So out of that paradox comes an opportunity. In a commission we published at the end of 2013, led by Dean Jameson and a fantastic team called Global Health 2035, they spoke of the notion of a grand convergence, that for the first time in human history, we have the ability to eliminate preventable mortality within a single generation by 2030, 2035. And the grand convergence was this, and this is shown here in terms of child mortality, that we take the pink line, which is countries with the highest child mortality, and the blue line, those countries like Australia and the UK with the lowest child mortality, and we have the knowledge today to be able to bring those two lines together within a single generation. What we require is the political will and the resources to do so. But we have the knowledge now to achieve that, and we've never before in human history been able to do so. The means by which we do it is, of course, the famous cube of universal health coverage, that we cover 100% of the population, all of them protected through financial risk and with the maximum number of interventions. And every country now is going through this process of thinking about where is it, where does it sit in that box of universal health coverage. And we have a politically propitious moment to achieve UHC, universal health coverage, and therefore to put us ourselves in a position to end preventable mortality within that generation. And that political moment took place two weeks ago. I took this photograph outside of the UN General Assembly building in New York just two weeks ago when the Sustainable Development Goals were signed by 194 nation states. Let's just spend a moment looking at that goals because it's a utopia that is being described. And some of my colleagues in global health laugh when they look at these goals because they seem so ridiculously idealistic. But there is something deadly serious about them. And it's serious because not only are they political commitments, not only are they technical promises for what might be achieved, but they also represent a moral covenant between nations, between peoples, about what we might do together. The notion that sustainable development is not about them in poor countries, it's about all of us. It's about our interdependence, that you and I depend on each other and depend upon everybody else on this planet. And that that vision, that philosophy, is expressed in these goals. Now, the sustainable, sustainable development goals begin with the commitments of the Millennium Development Goals continued over the next 15 years, ending poverty, hunger, ensuring healthy lives, education, and gender equality. But then we start to see what the other goals are going to be. Sustainable water and sanitation, energy, economic growth, industrialization, addressing inequality, urbanization, consumption and production, climate change, sustainable oceans, sustainable eco ecosystems, and peace for all. Now, this is where people laugh, because it seems so crazy that we could achieve that utopia. But John Rawls, the American philosopher, spoke about the idea of a realistic utopia. And I think this is what the Sustainable Development Goals can achieve. Now, you notice there are 16 goals there. There is a 17th goal, in some ways the most important goal of all. Because business as usual isn't going to deliver any of this. If we are going to achieve this realistic utopia, then this is what we have to do. Strengthen our means of implementation, which means revitalizing 
a global partnership. In other words, unprecedented cooperation between peoples, between nations. And in some ways, that really is the toughest challenge of all. When I look to my own region of the world in Europe and the refugee crisis that afflicts European countries right now, we are seeing precious little coordination or cooperation across nations. If we look in the Middle East, we see sim a similarly parlous state. So the world today is afflicted with more conflicts than at any time since the end of the Second World War. The world today is seeing more internally displaced peoples than at any time in recent history. So we have a challenge if we're going to meet the 17th goal on which all the prior 16 depend. Let's just spend a moment looking at the one that concerns us in the health community, and it's a very big agenda, but a very exciting agenda in what we can focus on in the next 15 years. Maternal mortality, newborn under five mortality in HTB, malaria, and neglected tropical diseases, all from the Millennium Development Goal era. But now, and this is of course the big epidemic that is sweeping middle-income countries massively, non-communicable diseases, and how are we going to address NCDs and mental health. Substance abuse, including alcohol, deaths from injuries, sexual reproductive health, and here's the big one, universal health coverage. So that's going to be a goal over the next 15 years, and finally from pollution as well. So environmental threats are there as well. Also in SDG 3, the health SDG, are how we're going to achieve that. Implementing the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, supporting research and development, absolutely critical. Science is not only intrinsically important to our society, it is an essential, vital instrument to achieve our hopes for better health and well-being, health financing and health workforce in building health systems, and, of course, the lesson of Ebola, building global health security to detect future risks. All of which, given that this is the optimistic story that is the prize that sits before us, begs this question. How should we try to redefine medicine and public health in the 21st century? Let me try and answer that question by going back to this man, McFarlane Burnett. In 1953, in January 1953, he published a paper in The Lancet entitled The Future of Medical Research. And I don't know his entire biography, but if you read this paper, you get a sense of a very remarkable man. A man not only who was a great scientist, but also a truly visionary thinker about science as a force in society to deliver public good. This is what he wrote. The, and the emphasis is his emphasis, not my emphasis. The great task of future medical research, he wrote, to plan the ways by which the bodily health and intelligence of human beings may last from generation to generation. This was 1953. This is a perfect mission statement for the Sustainable Development Goals, for sustainable development. That's exactly what sustainable development is about. It is about the future being as important as the present. What we do today has an impact on the future, and we should take that into account in every action we take today. He was ahead of us by a considerable number of decades. And for those of you, and there have been those, who wonder about the place of politics in science, he wrote this. Its implications, this vision of the future, into every phase of human life, politics and economics, even more than medicine. What McFarlane Burnett was saying to us was, science is our crucial instrument to realize the hopes of our society but it needs to be not just science for science's sake. It's science allied to a political and economic vision and the direction society is taking. A truly remarkable figure. 